Investors need to keep their finger on the pulse of change. Are we on the verge of a wage increase spiral? How is private capital changing the landscape for small firms? Can investors avoid greenwashing in their ESG exposure? Welcome to season two of the Outthinking Investor, an award-winning podcast from PGM. Subscribe to PGM's The Outthinking Investor today for these insights and more. This podcast is intended solely for professional investor use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. When you want to save money, check out the General. They're a quality car insurance company with great low rates, and they've been saving people money for nearly sixty years. Plus, they're super flexible. You can choose when and how you want to pay, whether it's cash, card, or check. So to get quality coverage at prices you can afford, call one eight hundred General or visit thegeneral.com. The General Auto Insurance Services Incorporated, an insurance agency, Nashville, Tennessee. Some restrictions apply. I'm Nick Westergaard, and this is On Brand, helping you tell your story. My guest this week is Katie McCleary. I believe that leadership is everywhere. Leadership is a almost a personality style and a choice in which you choose to learn how to go engage with all kinds of people and meeting them where they are at in their life, and not trying to go in and fix them, but trying to understand the conditions in which they are existing. Katie McCleary is a storyteller, professor of leadership, and a lover of people. She is co-author of *Bridge the Gap*, which Inc. Magazine named one of three business books to read in 2022. Her work has been featured by Forbes, PBS, Shondaland, New York Post, and more. Katie hosts NPR Cap Radio's leadership podcast, The Drive, in partnership with the American Leadership Forum. She's also the founder of 916 Inc., a nonprofit which has transformed over 4,500 youth into confident authors who know the power of their voice and story. Mashable.com named her as a real Miss Americas for her projects in low income communities. She teaches leadership in the master's program at Pacific University and is passionate about amplifying people's personal stories to create positive change. Katie, welcome to On Brand. Oh, thank you, Nick. I am excited to chat positive change. Let's let's get some of that. I totally agree. We are all due for a dose of joy. You know, and it's one of those things. Uh, I, you know, file uh, branding as 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 one of those too. But positive change storytelling. We, we talk about these things a lot, but you can have a really big impact. But I think the the H word comes into play. So, how do stories connect to creating positive change? Well. As humans, we are social creatures. We are natural storytellers. We process the world through stories. So the stories that we tell ourselves and the stories that we tell others deeply matter. And when we make a choice to tell an authentic story of change, all stories are about change, essentially, um, we need to take a moment in which to process what that change really meant within the story and It's sort of about how you view the world. Are you a half cup full or a half cup empty person? And we can really affect change when we reach out to humans and say, you know, maybe this horrible thing happened to me or maybe this unexpected change happened to me, but here's how I've processed through it. And here's where I land today on the better side of things. And so people need that. They need to see those role models and to hear those stories. So talk a bit about your work. I'm, I'm fascinated especially by what you've done in low-income communities because I think sometimes we talk about, about leadership and sometimes it, it can feel to some a, a little exclusionary it, it, that, it's the, that it's the top of the, well, it is cause at the top mm-hmm. of the org chart. But of course, there's broad definitions of leaderships. But talk about, about that community level work and how that brings some of these same themes to life. Absolutely. So I believe that leadership is everywhere. Leadership is an, I think that leadership is a 
almost a personality style and a choice in which you choose to learn how to go engage with all kinds of people and meeting them where they are at in their life and not trying to go in and fix them, but trying to understand the conditions in which they are existing and how can we create and shift those conditions in order to create better outcomes for people, for kids, for neighborhoods, for schools. Because if there's one thing I know to be true, Nick, it's that every single person wants to belong. Every single person wants their life to matter. Every single person wants their dreams to be fully realized. And so when we go into communities that have been assaulted by trauma, by um, decades and decades of injustices, you know, they're downtrodden, many of them, but their spirit and their need for belonging still matters to them. And so it's about tapping into that hope, tapping into what's possible and meeting them where they're at and helping them belong to themselves, to a greater cause and to their community. And when you gain power in that way, you can really change the momentum of a family, of a neighborhood, of a school. You know, you gave us such a great new definition of leadership. I was going to toss into the uh, the word soup that was my my last question. I was going to toss in the the Brené Brown uh, dare to lead definition about anyone who who you know sees potential in others and, and cultivates that. But I always always mess it up uh, when I repeat it, so I, <laughs> I thought I wouldn't try. But I love I love the Katie version of it because I, I like the idea of leadership as a personality choice and one that that is about uh, this I- I engagement and understanding of of others because i think when you see leadership like that it it does connect with what with the work of of communicating with others of of relating with others and and story as as a powerful way of of doing that Absolutely. So I'll tell you a story. At 916 Inc., we go into juvenile juvenile detention facilities. We go into group homes with kids who are experiencing trauma and homelessness. And um, we go into the foster care system. We go into low-income schools. We go, we go to the places where the majority of the population views that place as negative. We go in there and we bring joy. It is an active choice, Nick. When we show up in that classroom, in that room, in that home, we choose very intentionally to leave our own emotional baggage or the stress of our day at the door and to walk in and see the potential and the gorgeousness within every single child in that room. And that is an energy and it's a choice. It's an intentional way to be. We go in <clears throat> and we say, what matters to you? Tell me about where you're from. Tell me about what you want to be. These are really open-ended questions that um, allow them to begin to grapple with what they, what they could become. And then we offer writing prompts like seashells and spices and weird oddities and, and things that they've never seen or experienced before. And with that, we're bringing in a sense of wonder and awe. And there is nothing more potent than wonder and awe to open the brain of that child to new possibilities, especially if they feel safe and if they feel loved and they're not being seen for their trauma. They're not being seen for whatever labels society has put on them, even though what they're experiencing is very, very real. You know, we talked about the different levels of leadership and from community work like this, I would imagine that what you're describing it overlays pretty effectively into today's workplace where people are trying or at least giving lip service to creating a more inclusive environment. But I, I would think that this work 
could be uh, applied there as well. Is is that a crazy idea? I don't think it's a crazy idea. So <laughs> with, nine, with 916 Inc., we work with kids. But what happens is you get hundreds of adults that want to come in and volunteer. And that leads into conversations about their lives, right? As volunteers, like what's their what's their motivation? What's going on for them? We We want to know them too. And when you talk to them about their life, they're not very happy in their work. That's why they've come to 916 Inc. to find a meaningful place in which to joyfully engage and create an experience that utterly matters and transforms something. And they're not finding that in their in their work life. So when I left 916 Inc., I started on the journey of, you know, trying to train and equip leaders to 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 kind of create better cultures because if you know me, I call work sometimes the unforgivable machine, and we're all trying to exist in it. So what I'm really trying to do is take what we do at 916 Inc. and help um, companies bridge the gap between what their employees want, how they need to show up and communicate and collaborate, and how to create better cultures in which we can all belong and thrive. And I don't, I don't, I don't think that has to be like independent of getting to the bottom line. I think, in fact, it improves the bottom line when people are more engaged and motivated to be there. But leaders have to make an intentional choice to create a culture in which people want to belong. I think that's so important. I mean, back to, I forget what the what the mind-blowing stat is of how much uh, of our lives that we spend at work. And, oh my God, it's enormous. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. And and like where we're doing that and, and how we can amplify that to work as a community that has belonging. And I think when you see people that are really connected to their work, it's it's usually because of the the community that exists at work. But that's not always easy to create by the uh, <laughs> the, the unforgivable machine. So how, how do we how do we optimize the machine for creating belonging? I think there's really simple things that we can do. I think it's about leaders who are okay with being transparent. And when I say transparent, not like having to tell everybody every single decision they made and and, and let everybody show up in their pajamas. And like, you know, um, I think it's about a transparent way in which to behave at work. So making things like communication agreements where um, we begin to, here's one example, a tangible one, where we can begin to say, we're going to eliminate the word but from our conversations. And we're going to replace it with and. Because we live in a complex world where two things can be true at the same time. So very rarely is there a but conversation. It's mostly a yes and conversation. And just that one simple move where everybody can agree that they will diligently try to replace um, and with but can actually shift the dynamics of conversations because now it's more inclusive. Like that's one thing you can do. I think another thing that a leader can do to create a better culture is to take the time and actually schedule it on your calendar because we're always at the mercy of time and we're too busy and everything's back to back. But schedule in time to know your employees, to know their lives, to know what the big passionate dream thing is for them. And then to set time to create intentional ways for employees to engage and connect with one another. Because the truth is, is that if I know your story and I know what you're about, I often can't deny you your humanity, your dignity, your beliefs, your value system. And so we have to find ways in which to bring that into the conversation and into our everyday work world. On Brand, we'll be right back after this. 
Imagine working with your team on a project, and you're trying to do everything over email. Things seem to work well enough at the beginning, but once you start adding more than a couple of people or sharing more than a couple of files, the entire thing becomes disorganized. Managing projects is tough enough. It's a struggle to juggle people, work, and expectations under pressure. Problem is, many project management platforms make it even harder by overcomplicating things, leading teams to abandon tools when the promise fades and frustration sets in. That's when teams turn to Basecamp. Famously straightforward and effective, teams stick with it and projects thrive on it. Teams that use Basecamp send less emails and have fewer meetings. If you are struggling with projects, sign up for Basecamp. Their pricing is simple, and they give you all their features in a single plan. No upsells, no upgrades. Go to Basecamp.com forward slash on brand and try Basecamp for free. No credit card required and cancel anytime. Thank you, Basecamp, for sponsoring this episode. You may know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business? Jamie Lieberman hosts a great podcast called the UnBusiness Podcast. Jamie, tell us what these fine folks will get when they listen. The UnBusiness Podcast provides interviews with real-life entrepreneurs to talk about their struggles, their strategies, and how they have had success and what they've done in the face of failure. It is a real-life look at what it means to own your own business and gives you real takeaways on how you can make yours better. Awesome. Where can people subscribe? Go to hashtag dash legal.com backslash podcasts. Find the show at marketingpodcasts.net or search for the Unbusiness Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You heard her. Go subscribe. Now back to the show. So you're saying it's a lot harder than, than the ping pong table stuff. Totally. Totally. <laughs> that's, a, I, that's what I felt like when you were talking about the, the, the sweatpants. Or I feel like everybody looks for stuff to add. Oh, yeah. culture. We need, uh, yeah, it's the, it's the sweatpants, the ping pong table. The, and, be, the beanbag chairs, right. the free snack basket. <laughs> it has nothing to do with that. People are so hungry for meaningful engagement and experiences where they're involved not talked at or told to or reading fancy words splashed up on walls. They need real engagement. Well, you know, it's funny because you even began that, 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 uh, that, that call to action there with people are hungry. And I think, I think they just stop there and, and go with the snack basket uh, because great, well, we'll go to Costco. Yeah. <laughs> It's easy to, to to hop everybody up on sugar. It'll feed your endorphins, but it doesn't last. Well, and it's all, and and it's something you can check off of a list. But you talk about, I mean, and I like that you even were specific in saying schedule the time to get yeah. to know people because that's not that's not a trip to Costco and uh, and and a basket for for the break room. It's it's time. It is time. People want your t- so. Here's something that's really interesting that I think a lot about. I'm not sure that people really want your time. I don't think people want to naturally schedule one hour blocks of time with people. Instead, I think that people want a deep dive and they want your energy and presence with them. So I can have a meaningful conversation in 15 to 20 minutes when I choose to focus all my curiosity and attention on that other person. And when I ask them questions that open their brain, we can plunge fast and I can listen deeply for what matters to them, for their context, for what's at stake for them. And that can happen in a 20 minute conversation, even with the warm up and the small talk. And I think that there's an art to teaching that. And it's actually really simple, Nick. It's, it's about showing up and showing up clean and not with your own agenda other than to get to know that other person. And it starts with, tell me about, tell me about what you did on your weekend. Tell me about what's going in your sales pipeline. Tell me about, um, tell me about the thing that has recently brought you joy. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, that's a really good point because it, it, you know, I, like I said, schedule time isn't, isn't an easy thing. And I think our defaults are that our, sit down that is, you know, from the team member's perspective might end up feeling or like, like 
a root canal. Oh, we're going to sit. But yeah. like the, the, the 20 minutes of real connection, uh, that's, that's an important skill with, like you said, a, potentially a big payoff. Absolutely. And I think also learning how to be comfortable in silence with people is one of the most best connective tools that you can ever use to your advantage. It doesn't have to be awkward silence. It might feel awkward in your body at first to be in silence with someone, but once you get used to it, there is great connective power in just being with someone. Yeah. Yeah. And it's almost like in some cases, that's kind of part of the getting to know your people really well is, is kind of navigating some of that silence as well and, and building that, that kind of comfort level almost. Yeah. We actually um, tell leaders in our trainer program that um, we want you to create five to eight seconds of silence in all your interactions. And that includes group interactions in meetings. And then you do it at the transparent level so that people aren't weirded out. And like, why are you, why is this awkward silence happening? We say, let's give five to eight seconds of silence in order to process deeper, in order to reflect, in order to ask ourselves, is this really what we think? Um, And then also we teach leaders that, you know, if you have a great 15 to 20 minute dive conversation with someone, count in your head to five Mississippis before you offer your advice, your similar stories, your feedback, your options, like Give that space to honor what the other person said. So five seconds of silence, and then you say, thank you for sharing. And then you invite yourself in to give whatever feedback, story, me too, advice, options after that. You know, I'm left remembering you talk about powerful silences. And I always think about that moment in the... uh, in the Mr. Rogers movie, the what uh, the the Tom Hanks Mr. Oh, Rogers wow. movie, where there's that amazing moment of silence that feels kind of reminds us how powerful silence in listening in conversation with someone else can be. I mean, it's interesting thing to replicate in in a movie theater gathered to to watch a movie, but but still very powerful. And I love those, those ideas. So tell us a bit about your book, Bridge the Gap, which I mentioned earlier is an Inc. magazine, uh, one of three business books to read in 2022. So folks have, you know, a a limited number of months left. Uh, Let's, let's, let's get (laughs) to it. Uh, So Bridge the Gap I wrote with my wonderful work wife, Jennifer Edwards, and she from the, from the outside looking in, we seem like opposites, Nick. So for instance, I'm a liberal. She's a conservative. She's a devout Christian. I'm a practicing Buddhist. Um, we raise our kids differently. We think about economics differently. I mean, every single possible thing you could imagine, we're like the mismatched pair. But we wrote this book together because we wanted to give a framework for everyday professionals to become leaders in their relationships, especially with people who were seemingly really different than they were. And we wrote it during pandemic. We wrote it during the election. Um, And we just saw the fractionalization and the polarization that was everywhere. And it's creeping into the workplace. And there's this like profound study that 47 to 52% of arguments in the workplace were around polarizing politics and identity labels. And so if we really want to have a true democracy, we actually think it begins in the American workplace because you don't really get to choose who you work with very often. So it's a great way to practice inclusivity and understanding others' values and points of view. So the book is really practical. We give tons of hands-on shifts to make, um, ways to show up better, ways to build self-awareness and take personal responsibility for your relationships. And I think as it goes to branding, You know, how do you want to show up? How are you building a personal brand? And to take those moments to be really intentional um, is it can really change the dynamics of your conversations and the way that you experience the world. 
you know, you kind of did my job for me there. I usually come up with some sort of of shoehorning segue to to bring up the the topic of branding, but th- that is an important role when we look at how polarized we are as a society, and increasingly people look for. You talked about not being able to choose your coworkers, but we do choose brands. And we choose those brands that make us feel a certain way that provide us with that connection. And I mean, certainly one school of thought is we're going to be this. And, and if anybody doesn't like it, then, then they can, then they can take a hike, but in building something that is potentially more meaningful to more people, bridging that gap, I think would be important in brand building. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're all walking around wanting to to be who we are and for people to know us. And I know that gets tricky because humans get all weird and wonky around stuff. But honestly, we walk around building brand identity and reputation. And so how we show up really matters. And not not forcing it, but understanding deeply who are we? What is our story? What are we about? What are we looking to achieve? And how is that coming off and how I communicate? Katie, we've talked about some some big topics, and as as people are listening to this and nodding along and thinking, yes, I have to be, I, I would like to do a better job in how I show up at the workplace, how we show up as 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 a brand. What's what's one thing that I, I know we were just saying that the ping pong table and the snacks, it's it's not that. But what's one thing we could do in our day to day that that folks could take from this and say, I'm, I'm going to do this thing that Katie said differently. So before you were going to walk into a networking event or a meeting or even a one on one with a colleague or at home or in community. I want you to go and wash your hands. I want you to go to the bathroom in the mirror and look at yourself. And I want to wa- I want you to wash your hands in really cold water. It will reset your nervous system. It will help you maybe calm down. And when you're looking in the mirror, if you're not having any stress issues, I want you to just coach yourself and take five to 10 seconds to ask yourself, how am I going to show up? And when you look at yourself in the mirror, I want you to loosen your jaw, loosen your shoulders and smile. And I want you to walk in with one question that you intend to ask another person. And I think the question could be, tell me about what you're celebrating. Tell me about what you're working through. Tell me about what gives you joy these days. And if you ask that with a smile on your face and relaxed shoulders, you're going to go a long way to build connection and culture with someone. Wow. That was, uh, that was great. And I love that recipe for a check-in. I've actually got a board meeting right after this and I'm, I'm going to head there and I'm going to stop in the bathroom and and wash my hands first. So uh, I love, I love this idea. Katie, now it is my joy to ask you, for a brand that has made you smile recently. Yeah. So a brand that made me smile is a company out of San Francisco called Short Story. And they're one of those uh, clothing subscription box programs, and they're made for petite women. And I know I'm a writer and a storyteller, so of course I love Short Story, right? I mean, I've attached to that brand. (laughs) But they personalize everything for me and they write these little notes in their like um, in their little catalog when I get my box of clothes about why they chose it for me and where I could wear it. And from the cute pink box in the mail to just like, I feel seen. I feel seen by them. And they, I, I know it's a corporation, but I feel seen by them. And I, I just, I love it. That is a great, great example and, and such a meaningful brand touch point. I, I love hearing things like that. And like you said, sometimes that, that for people that, um, you know, that, that work in and around story a lot, anything, we're, we're suckers for, for story focused things. Yep. Katie, where can folks go to learn more about who you are and what you do? Yeah, they can go to, howtobridgethegap.com. 
And that has all the information about me, my co-author, our speaking reels, links to articles. And then I would love people to go check out 916 Inc., which is 916inc.org, and really see about the work that we're doing in storytelling with um, disadvantaged kids. Awesome. And we will link up to all of that in our show notes, which folks can find at onbrandpodcast.com. Katie, thanks for being on brand with us. Thank you, Nick. This was great. On Brand is part of the Marketing Podcast Network. If you like what you're hearing, if we've made you smile, you can always listen free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever your favorite platform may be. And please take a moment and rate and review the podcast to help others find the show. Until next week, I'm Nick Westergaard, and I'll see you on the internet. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.